architectural side, you'll get to talk to him, uh, you know, probably 80% of the time, and he can answer your, your questions directly right then and there. Also, if you're not familiar, we also are a Leica reseller, so we provide Leica laser scannings. Uh, it's really uh, popular now in the BIM world to capture as-built data. So literally you set this up in the inside of a room or outside, it goes around 360 degrees, it shoots up to 1,000 points a second, up to 900 feet. Anything it can see pulls into your computer with XYZ coordinates and you can measure information uh, seamlessly in there. You can bring this right into Revit and you can design uh, the as-built data right inside here comparing it to the scanned data in your Revit model. We can also take that to Navisworks or your AutoCAD architecture or AutoCAD MEP uh, as well. So a couple of ideas there and, and just want to introduce Sterling Systems and let's go ahead and move along to the presentation and just want to introduce Brandon, again, our senior uh, BIM specialist and lead uh, Revit guru here is going to walk you through the rest of the presentation. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Chad. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Um, I don't know if, Chad, you can confirm real quick that my audio is working uh, properly. Sounds real good, Brandon. Thanks a lot. Great. I'm going to go ahead and mute Chad here real quick just so we can see that. I um, wanted to just backtrack for one second real quick. I noticed there was a, a small glitch in the PowerPoint there. Um, uh, Dave Press is actually uh, the picture you're seeing there. He's the vice president of our sales department. My apologies for that. Um, th thank you, Chad, for helping us out to get us started. Again, uh, my name is Brandon LaCourcy. I work here with Sterling Systems. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the introduction of Revit family creation. So this is part two in our four-part mini-series on Revit architecture. Uh, for some of you that were in our previous uh, course, these next couple of slides may seem a, a little familiar, uh, but for those of you guys that were not in our, uh, our, introductor, our introduction to Revit architecture uh, course, uh, hopefully this is new information for you. A couple of things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, first are the course objectives for today's class. Uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, to start things off is industry and Revit terminology simplified. Uh, we're also going to talk uh, or, or take a little uh, introduction to the user interface as it pertains to family creation. So we're going we're to look at the family interface as opposed to our typical project interface. We're going to do some massing, which is a critical element involved with family creation. We're then going to talk about parametric modeling as well as parametric constraints. So we're going to go into those different uh, aspects of, of modeling. We're going to talk briefly about formulas, as well as how we can access the type properties menu and make those sorts of changes. And we'll wrap up uh, with a brief discussion on shared parameters. <clears throat> now, uh, the first thing that I want to talk about, and I, I'm going to be somewhat brief with these topics, um, is really just what Revit is. Uh, for those of you guys that are unaware, Revit is a building information modeling software, also known as BIM. I'm sure many of you guys have heard that acronym, uh, throw it around like green uh, last year. So definitely a popular term, a hot button phrase to say the least. Uh, BIM is really uh, made up of two parts. It's made up of what we call bidirectional associativity, as well as parametric relationships. Now, BIM uh, is sort of a larger topic. Uh, when we talk about what BIM is, it's, it's really three components. It's the building, which is obviously the vision that you develop for your clients, uh, oftentimes represented in the 3D uh, element, but sometimes maybe just in 2D documentation. Along with that building information, we, we tag along uh, data like drawings, schedules, specifications. And what's interesting about Revit is that it seamlessly links that information to the building data that you've developed. And finally, we have this model information. This is really one of the reasons that clients are demanding the use of BIM software. Modeling is, is really the, um, uh, the export or exportation of that data um, that allows things like facility management to occur, energy analysis. Um, we could even do things like life safety diagrams. There's a lot of different information that comes from that model ability that, that we find in the Revit software. Now, how is it developed? Well, Revit is what we call a parametric change engine, and that parametric change engine has things such as views, annotations, components, all sorts of elements that sort of tie into it. We're going to talk about a lot of those elements because in family creation, we really set the building blocks for how those components will interact with the parametric change engine that is Revit. There's two parts to Revit, and that the first of which is bidirectional associativity, and what that does is it ensures that changes 
that are reflected um, in one view correspond throughout a project. This is going to be relative to the parameters we're going to be building in our families later on today. We also have the ability to coordinate those changes and maintain consistency throughout a project. So if we make an adaptation to a family, as we're going to do later on today, we can, be rest, we can rest, uh, rest assured that all of those changes occurred throughout the project, not just in that particular instance. We also have something called parametric relationships, and we'll talk about this briefly as well. Really, it's the foundation of how Revit operates, and it's this idea that you know, one entity could be reliant on another. So we'll talk about that uh, as we move into family creation. Now, many, many business issues are resolved in using the Revit program, everything from design change corrections to collaborative design internally within an office. Uh, we're able to standardize company standards very easily in the program so that we're getting a consistent workflow and a consistent uh, end product for our clients. We're also able to integrate the design and drafting phases, and we can connect annotation designs um, to actual modeled objects, so they're not, there's not a disconnect between those elements. Finally, it helps uh, meet the demands of the new deliverable requirements that a lot of state organizations are requesting. Not to mention it helps um, architecture firms be more profitable in being able to produce more documentation in the same time that they're accustomed to producing their existing uh, level of detail. Now, Sterling Systems, as Chad talked about, is a, an excellent resource for you and your office. Uh, we have a couple of uh, opportunities that we've been presenting to our new clientele. Uh, we're providing one year of our gold support with each seat of software that's purchased through Sterling Systems. Uh, what that means is you're able to uh, reach a certified Autodesk professional such as myself by phone or email. We also provide virtual on-site support through this gold support program. Where we're, actually, we're actually able to VPN into your machine and either demonstrate a process or correct an issue that might be you know, you know, plaguing a project that you're working on. One thing we also want to bring up is in, on February 16th, we'll be bringing Lynn Allen in, who is a great Autodesk representative. She knows everything when it comes to Autodesk, whether it's AutoCAD, BIM News, what the highlights of the new product releases are going to be. She's fantastic and very well informed, and it's rare that she, uh, she travels uh, uh, to this neck of the woods. So we're very happy to have her, and we hope that uh, you guys will uh, join us for that February 16th presentation. We'll go through this a little bit longer. Again, uh, Dave Press, um, uh, the Vice President of Sales, um, was unable to attend the, uh, the, the event today, but fortunately Chad was able to step in and, and help with us. If you have any questions regarding your accounts, don't hesitate to contact Dave. Um, right there you'll see his uh, email address, Dave Press at sterlingsystemusa.com. Uh, you can also go to our website for additional information regarding Dave and our other uh, uh, programs that are available through Sterling Systems. Um, you can reach us by phone at 1-480-629-8131. Uh, again, my name is Brandon LaCourcier, and uh, my email is a mouthful, so um, hopefully you've got your pens handy there. Uh, sorry about the long last name, but I decided to do a two-part name in our email system, so mine's extra long. Um, but please feel free to email me with any questions also. Um, I also want to let everyone know about January 16th, we have part three of this uh, presentation, and what we'll be discussing in that one is editing family creation. So we're going to actually edit families we pull from sites like Revit City or Autodesk Seek. We're just going to talk a little bit more about the parametrics and how we can do things like set up formulas, make adjustments to those families, um, or maybe just enhance them to be a bit more parametric. Uh, also, Wednesday, January 25th, we'll be talking about uh, part four of this series, which are the top ten tips and tricks. We'll be covering things such as phasing, design options, also some other great features that are in the software that maybe you're not uh, very familiar with or something that you're interested in seeing. I know one of the big issues that we're going to talk about there is work sets, so something that uh, I think people are very interested in but not always uh, uh, so familiar with. So we'll definitely be covering those topics. Now, without any further delay, we're going to go ahead and start into family creation. Uh, I am going to go ahead and just ask that if anybody does have any questions or having difficulty with sound, they go ahead and, uh, and, and post on the question board real quick. Um, that way I can, uh, I can see it doesn't look, doesn't look like anybody else has had an issue here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, step into the next phase of the presentation. 
<clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and start by the uh, looking at the Revit architecture uh, home screen. So this is our startup screen. Uh, it's a new addition to the Revit interface as of 2009. Um, actually, uh, you're going to start to see this a part of a lot of the different uh, Autodesk platforms that are available, not just Revit in the coming years. Um, really great tool uh, to start up your projects. There are three sections to this. The first is the top section where you can start a new project. You can also open an existing project, either by going to the open tool or access, accessing one of the recent, wind, recent file windows. Just below that we have families, which we're actually going to work from today. And inside this family section you can also access recent families that you've developed. Finally at the bottom we have the resource center. This is where you can access information like what's new picks and clicks, help topics, as well as community chat boards where we talk about very important issues or problems that people might be experiencing. A great resource for new users or people that are just trying to master the interface and might have difficult questions. Now uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start with family creation. I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to be working out of Autodesk Revit Architecture 2012. Um, understand that you could also work from the Revit MEP or Revit structure interface and have very similar options as we're going to find in the Revit architecture interface. So if you are more familiar with the MEP program, you won't be uh, out of place in sitting through this uh, presentation. Uh, as I said, we can open up families from a couple locations. We can do it right here from our recent files window. We could select that we want to open an existing family, start a new family, uh, start a new conceptual mass, or we could access Autodesk Seek to find existing content that we might want to open and edit. We also could go up to the Revit symbol in the upper left hand corner. We could say that we want to create a new family. And once we do that, we're going to get what's called a new family selection uh, template file. We're going to have a bunch of template files that we can pull from. Now each one of these template files is specific to a type of content. And what's important to remember is these template files are specific to the, con the content's location in our visibility graphics settings. So for now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to navigate to generic model. One of the things I want to point out to you as we look at generic model as an example is that we have different methods for family creation. So as an example, one of the options that we have is creating a generic model that's adaptive, uh, which is more of a conceptual feature. We also could create a generic model that is ceiling based, so it's looking for ceilings to be placed. Uh, we have the ability to go ahead and do a face based generic model. We could do a floor-based family, a line-based family. Uh, we could do a pattern-based family, a roof, a wall, or we could just do a standalone. Now, not every piece of content is going to have all of these options, but generic possesses the majority of them. Uh, for now, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start with just a generic model. And we're going to go ahead and say open. Now when we open up our generic model, uh, we're going to notice that it looks very similar to when we start a new project. Um, we've got you know, some, some information that's uh, showed up here on our view window. Uh, we've got the ribbon up here across the top, our properties palette, and our project browser. So all things that we're familiar with. However, there are some adaptations when we're in the family uh, creation mode. One of it, which is the, is the ribbon itself. First of all, the home tab still possesses most of our modeling information but you'll notice that most of the modeling information is mass based. So creating things like extrusions, blends, revolves, sweeps, swept blends, or void forms. We also have things like model lines, placing components, model text, a lot of different features that we would find typically in generic modeling features. Also we have an insert tab and on the insert tab we can import other Revit information, we can link CAD data, uh, we can import an image or load a family if we wanted to. Our annotation tab is going to have all of our dimensioning, symbolic lines, masking regions, those sorts of items. Our view tab is going to be where we can create things such as sections, default 3D views. Uh, we could uh, develop a camera view if we wanted to. Our manage tab allows us to edit things such as shared parameters, transfer project standards, or purge unused data from our project. And finally, our modify tab is where we can make modifications to, pro or to content that we find inside of our project view. Our properties palette is largely the same. 
and our project browser is largely the same also. Now we're not going to get too specific into how the uh, interface navigates. Hopefully we've got some familiarity at this point with that. But what I am going to talk about is sort of uh, how it works in the sense of developing a family. A couple of things to, to realize right out of the gate are our reference planes. Now, right out of the gate, you're going to notice that the software is presenting two reference planes to us. Also, you'll notice that these reference planes are named. So you'll need to notice it says center, front, and back. You'll notice that it also says center, left, and right. When we select these uh, reference planes that we see on screen, you'll notice over here in our properties palette that we have an opportunity to name those items. So I can actually name a reference plane. Really a great, a great feature when we have multiple reference planes that exist within one view. You'll also notice that these reference planes are pinned. Now they don't have to be pinned. Uh, we could go ahead and unpin them and do different things with them. Or we could pin one and leave another uh, unpinned. Uh, for now what we're going to do is we're going to leave these objects pinned because it's important that we have a solid constraint to work from. Before we get into developing constraints and, and really getting into developing a, an actual family, let's talk about massing and all the different massing options we have. The first massing option we have is creating an extrusion. This is a very simple process. If I select the extrusion tool, you'll notice that I get a contextual tab called Modify Create Extrusion. Now what I can do from this tab is I can go ahead and generate a shape. I'm going to just go ahead and generate a simple shape. An important thing to remember when we're generating these shapes is they must be a closed loop. That's not to say that they can't have multiple loops, though. As an example, if I were to create a shape similar to this and then select my Finish button, you would notice that in a 3D view, it's generated a shape with a hole in it. That isn't the only way for us to make a hole in a shape. But for now, we just wanted to see some of the flexibility we had in generating a shape. I'm going to go ahead and select the new shape that we just placed, and I'm just going to drag it over to the side so we can build some more shapes. I'm going to, again, go to my Home tab, and I am going to select the Blend tool. Now, the Blend tool is a bit more complicated than the Extrusion tool. In the Blend tool, we basically set a base for our shape, and we set a top for our shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by creating my base shape. So I'm just going to go ahead and do a, uh, a simple square. Now I know that I'm working on my base shape because if I look at my contextual tab, the only option I have is to edit top. So if I were to go ahead and hit edit top, you'll notice that this now says edit base, and the information that I drew has now gone to a grayscale, which means the base information is already in place, but it is currently not editable. I'm going to go ahead and develop a second shape. In this case, I'll do a circle. And you'll notice that I do have the ability to switch back to the base shape if I wanted to and make additional modifications. Once I'm happy with my top and my bottom, I can go ahead and hit Finish. And again, if I switch to 3D, I notice that I've developed a shape where the two pieces have kind of uh, turned into each other. You'll notice that I do have grip controls, so I can go ahead and make adjustments with those grip controls. You'll also notice in selecting the object that in our properties palette, we have the ability to make changes, so I can go ahead and you know enter in, as an example, six feet, so it would modify it. I'm going to switch back to my reference level, and I'm going to again move the shape just off to the side. I'll zoom in again to my uh, reference planes that I have on screen here. I'm going to go to my Home tab, and I'm going to create a revolve. Now, before I do this, it's important that we understand what our work planes are in generating these revolves. Now, as an example, I'm in a floor plan view right now. So if I select my revolve tool, and I go ahead and I draw a shape, I'm just going to go ahead and draw um, just sort of a, an interesting shape here. I'm 
Nothing overly complicated, just something sort of simple. And then from there, I'm going to generate what's called an access line. So it's a point that it's going to rotate around. Now remember, by doing this in a floor plan, what I've done is I've effectively drawn a shape on a floor, floor plan, and I'm asking it now to revolve around that shape. So if I go ahead and hit Finish and switch to a 3D view, I should notice that it developed sort of a wheel, a wheel shape, right? Now, I'm going to go ahead and move our wheel shape over to the side here. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to a front elevation view. And again, from my front elevation view, I'm going to select the Revolve tool. And I'll go ahead and draw another shape, this time doing it again in the elevation view. Now this time when I use my access line, I'm telling it to rotate around my elevation view. So when I hit finish, I should get a shape that obviously contradicts the orientation of our wheel. So notice when we, when we use revolves, it's very important that we understand which, ele, which view we're, in, we're working in. It's really important in any, any one of the views that we develop, but, but um, especially important when we talk about uh, operating in our revolves. I'm going to again switch back to my reference level. I'm going to switch to my home tab and I'm going to select the sweep tool. Now with the sweep tool, I really have two parts to this. I first need to sketch a path. So I need to go ahead and sketch a path for my shape to move along. Once I've sketched the path, I then need to develop a profile for that path. So over here on the right, I could go ahead and either select a profile that's been loaded. I could load a profile. Or I could, as an example, edit a profile. And in this case, you'll notice that I have by sketch selected. So if I hit edit profile, and I switch to a 3D view, you'll notice that I see the crosshairs in relationship to the path that I've drawn. So as an example, if I were to go ahead and just draw a simple circle and say finish, and finish one more time, I would notice that that path is then followed. Perfect. Worked out very well for us. I'm going to again switch to my reference plane. I'm going to say that I want to create a swept blend. Just like when we did a sweep, we need to first sketch a path. I'm going to, in this case, draw a big arc. And then say finish. You'll notice that I have two profile options. So if I go ahead and say select profile one and I say edit profile, then in my 3D view, draw a circle at one end, and then say Finish. I'll do Select Profile 2, Edit Profile. I'll draw another circle, but I'll draw a much larger one this time. When I say Finish, and Finish again, you'll notice that that shape blends itself along my swept path. One thing to keep in mind, swept paths have a little bit of difficulty when you get into a complex path as well as a complex shape. So you don't want to get overly complicated in the development of your, uh, of your various shapes. But you can get away with quite a bit, much more than you could in a program like SketchUp or, um, for that matter, even, even some of the other uh, 3D modeling programs that are out there. Does anyone have any questions about simple massing? Something you'd want to see again, something that didn't look quite right. All right, great. I am going to go ahead and switch back to my reference plane. And I'm going to delete these little masses that we developed here. I'm just going to get rid of them. And I'm going to zoom back into our reference plane. A quick, a quick reminder as we get into family creation, one of the things that a lot of people um, uh, 
do incorrectly is when we develop a family, when we go ahead and develop a, um, a family that we're going to be working with, it's important that we, before developing any 3D mass content, we first develop our reference planes. Our reference planes are what, gonna, are what uh, are gonna guide us in the development of content. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna build a, um, a, a table. I'm gonna go ahead and start by building a table. I'm gonna go ahead and close out of the generic family that we worked in. I'm gonna go up to my R symbol in the upper left hand corner. I'm gonna go ahead and say that I want to create a new family. And I am going to scroll down to where it says Furniture. I'll then say Open. And I now have something that looks very similar to the previous display that we had. One thing that I, I like to point out, though, is that um, just because they look similar doesn't mean they are similar. Um, there is something that is somewhat different about this. One thing is that uh, when we look at the family category, the family category is set to Furniture. So this is very important for obviously when we work uh, and loading our content into our project. Now in order to begin developing this family, I need to first develop some reference planes as I talked about earlier. If I look at the home tab of the ribbon, I can find a tool actually called reference plane. And if I select that tool, I can go ahead and say pick lines and develop, begin developing a couple of reference planes. I'm going to go ahead and just put a couple of reference planes on screen here. To make it easier for yourself, one of the things that I like to do is I like to um, just change the length of some of my reference planes so I can sort of decipher between uh, center lines and non-center lines. It makes it a little bit easier um, just to, to, to sort of get a feel for what's what. Now, very quickly, I've gone ahead and I've developed some, some generic reference, reference planes that I can work for. And what I'm doing here is I'm actually building my table top. That's really the, the first point or first part of this family is building my table top. I'm going to switch to the Annotate tab of the ribbon, and I'm going to select my Align Dimension tool. Now, once I have my Align Dimension tool selected, I'm going to go ahead and select my first, my middle, and my last reference plane on this face. I'm going to do the same on the opposing side. Now from there what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add a parameter. I'm going to add a parameter to these um, reference planes. I'm going to go ahead and select my dimensions that I have placed in here and I'm going to apply what's called an equality parameter. And I'm going to do this on both sides. Now the reason it's important, what's important about doing that is obviously if I move one of these reference planes, you'll notice that it's moving the corresponding reference plane as well. Now this will be very important for us in just a few moments. Now at this point I haven't developed an adjustable parameter. I haven't developed a parameter that I can make modifications to within the type properties of this family. Now when I talk about type properties, um, that's really an important part of the discussion of family creation. There are two sets of parameters when we build content. There's what we call type properties. There's what we call instance properties. Now our type properties are properties that are specific to this particular type of table. So as an example, we might have a table that is a 30 inch, a 40 inch, a 50 inch. These might be varying table types. However, all of these tables might have the opportunity to have different finishes. So the finish might be an instance parameter in that setting. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. It's a little bit easier to understand when we actually really get into the nitty gritty of, of how we develop parameters. What I'm going to do is again go to the Annotate tab and I'm going to select my Align Dimension tool. I'm going to pick my two outside reference planes. And I'll do this on the opposing side as well. Once I've done this, I'm going to go ahead and select my new dimension. And you'll notice when I do this that in my options bar, I get some new information. One of the things you'll notice that it says label and right now it says none. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say that I want to add a parameter. 
And I have a couple different parameter types that I can do here. I could first develop what's called a family parameter. This is a parameter that cannot appear in a schedule or a tag once it's placed into our actual project. There's a couple of reasons for that. We'll talk about some of those later on, uh, more so next week when we get into uh, adjusting families. But we also have the ability to create shared parameters. Now, these are parameters that can be shared with other projects or other families. So as an example, if it was a parameter that we might want to tag a piece of furniture by, we would want to use the shared parameter tool because that's a parameter that could then be imported into a family tag or into a, uh, an annotated tag. We're going to go ahead and start by creating a family parameter. And the name for this parameter is going to be the width. Notice that the type parameter is already filled out for me. It says length. And the group parameter is already set to be dimension. There's lots of different group parameters that I could specify this by. The group parameter is really the, the designation of how this parameter is going to be grouped in our type properties. For now, dimensions is fine. Again, I'm going to list this as a type parameter, and I'm going to say OK. Now, in doing so, you'll notice that the width uh, parameter now presents itself in this annotation. I'm going to do the same thing on the lower hand side here. I'm going to, again, select my dimension. I'm going to say that I want to add a parameter. And I'm going to go ahead and say that I want to add a length parameter and say OK. The first rule in family creation is that we always want to test what we've done. We always want to test the adaptations and the adjustments that we're making. So as an example, what I'm going to do is on the Home tab of the ribbon, I'm going to select my Family and Types tool. And when I do this, I'm going to get a little prompt to that shows my width and length parameter that I generated. Now, if I were to go in here and adjust, for instance, the width from 4 feet to 6 feet and hit Apply, I'd want to be uh, assured that down or over in my view window that that adjustment was also made. I want to do the same thing with my length. So I'll go ahead and say six feet again, and I'll say apply. Notice that it made the adjustment. No error messages prompted. Everything looks great. I don't care how excellent of a family creator you are or how experienced you get. It's always important that we're always checking to make sure that these sorts of things are happening. It's way easier to catch an error in the early development of a family than it is later on once the family's already been generated. So this regular checking is a very good practice. Next what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and switch to an elevation view. So I'm going to switch to my front elevation. You'll notice that right now I have a reference plane, a reference level shown here. I've got a couple of reference planes that I see on screen. Um, these reference planes are actually planes developed from our reference level, our floor plan level. I'm going to go ahead and create another reference plane. And I'm going to say that this reference plane occurs 30 inches off of our reference level. I'm going to again go to my Annotate tab. I'm going to select my Align Dimension tool. I'm going to pick my top and then my reference level. I'm going to apply another parameter to this one, and I'm going to say that this parameter is height. And again, just to make sure that that works properly, I'm going to go ahead and open up my Type Properties window. And I'll change the height to 3 feet, hit Apply. You'll notice that it changed, no problem. So very quickly, you can see we've developed a, a pretty generic um, uh, layout. Now I'm going to uh, just sort of drive things a little bit, um, a little, make things just a hair more complicated. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to develop some reference planes for the legs of this table. So I'm going to develop some reference planes for the legs of the table. I'm going to start by going to the Home tab, grabbing my Reference Plane tool, grabbing my Reference Plane, and I'm going to create some reference planes that sit two inches inside of the edge of my table. And if you remember what I talked about just a few moments ago, 
very good to toggle some of these dimension or some of these reference planes just for the sake of, of obviously deciphering between which reference plane is which. Unfortunately, we can't color code them yet, but uh, um, for the time being, we have to kind of use these little tricks just to have a better understanding of how this stuff's going to work. I'm going to develop one more type of parameter real quick. I'm going to create a locking constraint. So what I'm going to do is, again, go to my Annotate tab. I'm going to grab my Dimension tool. And I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick dimension from the outside edge of my table to what's going to be the inside leg of the chair. And I'm going to lock that parameter. Again, I'll do this on the other side as well. Now, the reason for doing this is so that the edge or the overhang of that um, the overhang of that uh, um, table is consistent. You know, it's always going to have a two-inch overhang, regardless of what the table changes in size. So just to recap, we've created three different types of parameters. We've created adjustable parameters. We've created equal, equal, to, equal parameters, equalizing parameters. And we've created locking parameters. So all three of these are different types of parameters that we can work with. Now I'm going to go ahead and just check to make sure that that 2-inch is consistent. I'm going to, again, open up my family and types window. I'm going to change my width to 6 feet my length to 6 feet, and my height I'll change to 2, 6, and I'll say apply. No error messages prompt. Everything looks great. Notice the 2 inches was maintained. Everything moved properly. Perfect. Exactly what we want. Again, I, ha I can't stress enough the need to just continually check to make sure all of this information is continually updating properly. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the legs. So I'm going to create the, the leg, uh, the reference planes for our legs in this. I'm going to again go ahead and create another reference plane. I'll go ahead and say two inches once more. Another thing to keep in mind is that everything starts to get a little dizzy at this point. You know, there's, there's so much information on screen that sometimes it can become, um, you know, almost a bit overwhelming in looking at some of the, the information. Um, it gets easier the more you work on the families. You know, it gets a little bit, you know, you start to sort of see things a bit better, but it takes a little bit of getting used to um, just to, to see all this content kind of start to pile up. You got something that looks a little crazy at the moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a parameter, um, an adjustable parameter for the legs. So what I'm going to do is from my annotate tab, I'm going to grab my dimension tool. I'm going to pick the reference plane that's attached to the locking parameter. And I'm going to just go ahead and place a couple of these dimensions around the project. Now the reason for doing this again is so that this parameter for our leg is adjustable. And I'm going to go ahead and select one of the parameters. I'm going to say that I want to create an add parameter. And I am going to put leg. We'll say, uh, we'll just say TL. This doesn't pile up on us too much here. So we can see that the table leg is two inches right now. Now what's great is I don't have to do that uh, same process over and over again. I don't have to like select the, per the parameter, go in, add a parameter. What I can do because these parameters are all the same is I can just simply select them, go to the label, and apply a label. So another, another nifty trick is the ability to apply a label to a, a said parameter. Now again, we've added quite a bit of data here, so I just want to make sure everything's working properly. What I'm going to do is I am going to go ahead and open up my Family and Types window. I am going to change everything. So I'm going to change the width of my table. I'm going to change the length of my table. I'm going to change the table leg. I'll say the table leg is uh, 4 inches. 
and I'll change the height to, and I'll say apply. Again, I didn't get any, uh, um, I didn't get any error messages. Everything seems to be updating properly. But again, I just want to keep making sure that I'm checking on the off chance that I maybe missed something. You know, maybe something didn't work quite the way I wanted it to. Now that we've got a, a good chunk of data built, now that we've got kind of everything sort of working the way we want it, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, and just build some more, uh, build some content. You know, we've built a lot of parameters at this point. Uh, probably not a bad idea to to just go ahead and and, and start building uh, some entities. One of the things that I'm noticing though, right out of, off the top of my head, is that the first thing I want to build is the tabletop. Uh, that's that's really the first thing I want to build. But if I look at a front view. One of the things that I don't have right now is a tabletop thickness. So what I probably want to do is add one more reference plane that I can lock for that table thickness. So what I'm going to do is I'll apply two inches here. I'll just offset that top. I'll again go to my annotate tab, select my align tool, and I'll just go ahead and, uh, and dimension what's going to be my tabletop thickness. Now you'll notice that I'm using some abbreviations here. Um, one of the reasons I'm doing this is just because I want to, uh, I want to keep this um, sort of uh, uh, abbreviation you see at the end of the dimension sort of small. Tabletop thickness gets a little long, so I use a lot of abbreviations just to make it a little bit easier for me to see things on screen. I'm going to go ahead and switch back to my reference plane. And I'm going to go ahead and draw my table top. I'm going to go to my Home tab. I'm going to select my Extrusion tool. I'm going to grab my Rectangle tool. And I'm going to go ahead and draw a rectangle along that outside reference plane that I developed. One of the things you'll notice when I do that is I get these locking constraints. And what these do is they lock the face or the edge of that to the actual reference plane. Now, why is that important? Well, what's, what's important about it is when we go in to our type properties, we want to be able to make adjustments to the length and width of our table and obviously have the shape change also. So you'll notice by making these changes over here, the shape changed also. So not having to do things like, for instance, uh, adjust uh, thicknesses by you know, using these push pulls, the parameters are actually controlling the size of the shape. If I switch to a front elevation, you'll notice that uh, my shape is sitting uh, not quite within the, the tabletop height and thickness that I have drawn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, from my Modify tab, select my Align tool. I'm going to pick my top reference plane and the top of my shape, and then lock those two items together. I'll also lock the bottom of that table to the thickness of the tabletop. I'll switch to my 3D view, and I'll just go ahead and make a couple quick changes. Again, I'm going to change the width of this. I'll change the table thickness. Um, I'll go ahead and change the table length, and I'll say Apply. You'll notice the thickness changed, everything grew, and again, no error messages on screen. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and build the legs for this table. This will be a bit more complicated. I'm going to go to the Home tab. I'm going to grab my Extrusion tool. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, one by one, draw in that leg. Now I want to make sure that I lock that leg in four spots every time. Now the reason I say every time is because you'll notice that things start to get a little cluttered, right? I'm seeing lots of padlocks all of a sudden. Some lock, some not. I want to always make sure that I'm locking four padlocks every time I do this. Because that's locking all the sides. You'll notice that even sometimes the locks end up on top of each other. So again, making sure we're counting this off. One, two, three, four. Do it one more time, right over here. One, two, three, four. 
I'll go ahead and say finish and I'll switch to my front elevation. You'll notice that the height isn't quite where it needs to be. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll align the tabletop thickness to the legs and lock. Now if I go ahead and switch to my 3D view, you'll notice that I've developed a pretty simple table, nothing major. And you'll notice that if I go to my type properties and I change things like, for instance, I'll change the uh, width to 8 feet. I'll change the tabletop thickness to 2 inches. I'll change the length to 3 foot 6. And I'll change the height to 3 feet. And I'll say apply. Very quickly, I'm able to obviously modify the size and shape of my table. Let's go ahead and change those legs also. Change the legs to two inches and hit apply. Notice the legs are also adjusting. So everything's parametric. Everything's kind of talking back and forth. We're getting really great information from this family. Now let's talk about some other opportunities we have in generating a family. I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to just change the width and length back to four feet and say apply. Say OK. I'll switch back to my reference level. We're going to go ahead and, and just make this a bit more interesting, make this um, uh, uh, family just a little bit more uh, exciting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a hole on the top of this table. Now we have a couple of ways that we could do this. We could first select our tabletop, select Edit Extrusion, and if we wanted to, we could create a hole using our square tool within this tabletop. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create what's called a void form. And what a void form does is it actually subtracts information from another form. So you'll notice on the Home tab, if I go to void, void Form, all of my form styles are available. The difference being is these actually void as opposed to add. So what I'm going to do is select the Void Form to, or Void Extrusion tool. I'm going to go ahead and use my Rectangle tool. I'm going to draw a square. And I'm going to lock that in a few locations. I'll then say Finish. And I'll switch to a 3D view. Now you'll notice that I've got this void form and it's, it's kind of sitting at the, on the floor right now. So if I switch to a front elevation, I'm probably going to want to align that void with the associated elements. Now if I go ahead and switch to 3D, you'll notice that at the moment, all it's done is created this little orange block. What I need to do is on the Modify tab, select my Cut Tool. I then could go ahead and select my face of my form, and then select the void. And you'll notice it now subtracts out that piece of information. Now what I could do if I wanted, I'm going to switch back to a reference plane, is I'm going to go to the Home tab. And I'm going to go ahead and draw another extrusion. I'm going to draw the extrusion in the same place that I drew the void. And I'll say finish. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this piece of void into a piece of glass. So I have sort of a glass inlay inside of my table. What I can do is I can go ahead and first draw another reference plane. And I'm going to say this reference plane is about a half inch down. And I'm going to create a locking parameter so that our glass maintains that half inch thickness. So if I switch to a 3D, you'll notice that that hole has kind of been plugged with an object. Now if I switch to a shaded display, 
you'll notice that currently all of the entities that we see in the project are all this gray color. You know, they're just, they're just blank gray. Now I could go ahead and change that. I could actually add some material properties to this content. Now material properties are fairly important because they allow us to adjust various entities in our model you know, by, by manipulating the materials we see on screen. What I can do is select an object, and when I select an object, I'll notice in my properties palette, I have an option over here called materials and finishes. And right now you'll see the material says by category. Now if I go ahead and hit this little box just to the right of where it says by category, you'll notice I'm able to associate a parameter to that. So if I were to go ahead and hit add a parameter, I could say table legs. I'll group that parameter under material finish and I'll say OK and I'll say OK. I'll do the same to the ring around the top here with my rail system. I'm going to go ahead and select it. I'll go ahead and say by category. I'll add a parameter and I will say table top. OK. OK. And I'll select our piece of glass. I'll add a parameter to that. Add a parameter. And I'll say table glass. Say OK. Now just by putting those words in there, I didn't necessarily change the representation of my table on screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to my family and types window. And you'll notice that I now have an option in here to make some adjustments, adjustments to the values. So as an example where it says table top, right now the value says by category. I'm going to go ahead and select on that little uh, button with three prongs on it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add a material real quick. I'm going to say uh, table legs. Actually, I'll just say um, uh, table wood. We'll say one. And for my appearance, um, or for my material, what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to go down to wood. I'm just going to select, um, I think there's a, a good walnut in here, actually. Let's just, uh, we'll grab that walnut real quick. Um, actually, you know, we'll do a teak with a natural polish. So I've got uh, the, the teak applied for the table legs, and I'll say OK. Uh, or for the table top, I'm sorry. For the table legs, um, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll apply table wood one as well. Um, you know, in this instance, maybe we want those to be the same thing. Say OK. And for the table uh, glass, I'm going to go ahead and apply glass. Um, say OK. OK. And you'll notice very quickly I'm able to obviously have these differing materials display on screen for me. Now we haven't talked about everything as it relates to family creation. Still a few more uh, components I want to talk to you about. But we'll just do a couple quick things here just to dress the family up a little bit. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add a sweep that goes around this family. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Home tab. And from the Home tab, I am going to grab my Sweep tool. And one of the options I have is to pick a path. Now, picking a path is a really great tool because what it does is it actually constrains the path to the object we pick. So as an example, I'm just picking the table edge that I have shown. I'm going to go ahead and say Finish. And next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and apply just a, a nice edge to the, to, the, to the end of this table. I'm going to go ahead and say Edit Profile. And I'm going to go ahead and draw just a little shape here. We'll say it comes out uh, you know, an inch. Um, and we'll say it comes down, uh, um, uh, we'll say it comes down a distance of something nominal.
So nothing crazy here. Just went ahead and drew just sort of a generic shape. I'm going to do something a little strange here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a dimension real quick to this shape. So you'll notice it says right now that that's three and a quarter. I'm going to say that this parameter is, um, oh, we'll say this is the um, edge. We'll say uh, table edge. We'll say OK. I'm going to go ahead and say finish, finish. So I get this sort of a nice shape that goes around. I'm going to apply a material to that also. We'll say um, add a parameter, uh, table, edge. Oh. We'll say uh, um, table, edge, metal. Okay, and I'll uh, I'll go into my shared parameters here real quick. I'll just add a quick material on here. Um, we'll uh, we'll go with a um, kind of a cool uh, bronze, like a polished bronze, and uh, we'll say okay, and okay. So I've got some, some information on screen here. What I'm going to talk to you about briefly here is formulas and how we can create a formula. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my family and types window. And in my family and types window, I am going to take a look at my table edge. Now, right now, my table edge is three and a quarter of an inch. Let's say that I wanted my table edge to relate to my table thickness. So we notice that table thickness is TT. It's located right here. Now, right now, the table thickness is 2 inches. Let's say I wanted the table edge to be the table thickness plus, we'll say, 1 inch. Now you'll notice when I do that, that the table edge now or switches to three inches. So as an example, if I were to change the table top to four inches and hit apply, my table edge would switch to five inches. So these items are now related to one another. They're directly related to one another. Now this is a pretty uncomplicated formula. If you actually take our family creation course, we get into very, very detailed formulas where we talk about if-then statements. Uh, we talk about um, how we develop parametric formulas that work with things um, uh, such as um, uh, uh, you know, shelving units or, or systems where we might have um, uh, information uh, that's set up by an array parameter, which is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, we also work with things such as um, yes-no parameters that touch on uh, visibility. Um, so a lot of different items that we get into in our family creation course. Um, and you're welcome to contact Dave Press in regards to that if it's something you might be interested in. Also, as you can see in this simple demonstration, we developed a, a pretty uncomplicated table. But I'm sure you can imagine when we talk about something much more complicated than something like a table, we get far more technical um, in the way that we set up those parameters. So a service that we offer here at Sterling is actually generating content for your office, which includes things such as fully parametric doors that have automated swings um, or adjustable swings. We also get into things such as nested families, which can sometimes make it a bit easier for your firm to work in a more seamless work setting. We're not going to get into any of that today in this introduction to family creation. We're getting, uh, we're sort of keeping things a little bit more um, uh, um, general. However, I'm hoping that uh, you're able to take something away from this. Uh, this presentation. Now what I'm going to do is, um, uh, for some reason, it, uh, I'm guessing I just didn't say use reference here. Um, we're just going to go ahead and, and, and just just uh, change a couple more quick things uh, in working with this family. I'm not, um, I'm not crazy necessarily uh, about the table leg thickness, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to up the thickness of these table legs. We'll say to four inches, and I'll say okay. 
just gets it a little bit meatier. It looks like a, a nicer table at this point. Um, one thing that I also am, I, I'm, I'm interested in doing um, would be putting some chairs around this, you know, getting some, some chairs around this. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and place some chairs. Uh, I'm going to go ahead first, though, and switch to a reference level. One of the things that's very important in building a family is creating different types. So I'm going to go up to my family and type window. And I'm going to go ahead and just generate a couple of types. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start by creating a new family, uh, new family type. I'm going to say that this is a, um, uh, we'll say, uh, um, square dining. And I'm going to leave this as the 4x4, four four, and I'm going to change the height in this instance to 2 feet 6 inches. I'm going to create another new type, and I'm going to call this one a um, rec dining. And the thing I'm going to change about this is the table's length. I'm going to go ahead and change the table length in this instance to um, 6 foot 6 inches. And I'll change the width to 3 foot 6 inches. Height will stay at 2 6. I'm also going to go ahead and say bar dining. And in this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the width to 5 feet, the height to 3 foot 6, and the length to 5 feet. And I'll say OK. Now what's important about what I just did is actually if I switch through different types, if I actually switch through the different types that I've built on screen, you'll notice that that table changes based on the type that I have selected. So these various types now modify the display on screen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and switch to a reference level, and I'm going to place some chairs in real quick. I'm going to go to the Home tab, and on the Home tab, what I'm going to do I'm sorry, I'm going to go to the Insert tab. I'm going to load a family. And I am going to go to Furniture. And I am going to load, let's see if we've got a simple chair here that we can put in. Something that's kind of cool. I'm not seeing anything that's all that cool here. We'll just use these, uh, this little stacking chair as an example. And we'll say Open. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and place that stacking chair on screen here. And if I switch to a 3D view, I should notice that I have a chair. If I go ahead and select that chair, if I had to guess, there's probably some parameters in here. And what I'm going to do is I am going to go ahead and apply the right wood. So notice now we have a, the wood is now matching on this chair for us. Now I'm going to add a visibility parameter to this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold or click all of these chairs that I have on screen. I'm going to click all of them here. And I'm going to add a label to them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this one the square dining table or square dining. And I'll say OK. Next what I'm going to do is on my reference level, I am going to go ahead and um, switch my type to my rectangular. And I am going to temporarily hide those chairs that I've already placed. And I'm going to, again, put in some more chairs.
And what I'll do is I'll select those chairs and I'll apply a parameter to them. I will go ahead and say rec uh, table. Say OK. I'm going to go ahead and temporarily hide those as well. Whoops. And now what I'm going to do is I am going to switch my type to the bar style. I'm going to go up to the insert tab and I'm going to type in uh, stool. See if Autodesk Seek's got a nice stool that we can use. Perfect. Use this guy right here. I want to make sure this is uh, working right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to load the stool that I just got off Autodesk Seek right into our project here. Not quite sure how this stool looks, so what I'll do is we'll look at it in 3D. Looks like we got it the right way. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to put this stool in a couple places. Bear with me for just a second here. See if this works. Perfect. Move these out just a bit. And again, I'll just apply, apply a quick visibility parameter to these stools. Now, there is a very good reason for why I did all of this. And it's because what I'm going to do is I'm going to toggle it so that depending on which option or which type of table we have, the stools are represented properly. So as an example, if I go into my type uh, if I go into my type properties and I look at bar dining, you'll notice that right now um, uh, the um, options are set up for each one of these uh, particular tables. Now what I need to do is I want to make sure that um, they're displaying or not displaying based on how I want them to read on screen. Um, what I want to do though, you know what, sorry, I, I did set up a parameter on each one of these. What I wanted to do, though, is just set up a um, quick visibility on this. Just give me one second here, and I'll have this all set up right. Kind of looks like a, a cluster on screen here. My apologies. Give me one second, and I'll get this all the way we want it. All right. So when we look at our type properties, what we want to see now is the option to turn that particular chair on or off. One of the other things that's nice about adding parameters to those items is that if that family had multiple types, which in this case it actually doesn't, um, we could go ahead and make those adjustments. 
Um, now, what we want right now, though, I've got the, uh, the um, uh, I have this set up kind of the way I need it to. Um, I just want to turn off the parameters so I don't see uh, certain things on screen. I'm going to go ahead and just get rid of these um, other parameters that, that aren't really important to what we're doing. But what I am going to do is I'm going to say that I, in our bar setting, I don't want to see the rec chairs and I don't want to see the square, or the, the square table chairs. And in the rec version, I don't want to see the square version and I don't want to see the bar chairs. And in my square version, I don't want to see the rec chairs and I don't want to see the bar chairs. I'm going to go ahead and say OK. Now, it looks like I've got a whole bunch of data on here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save this family and I'm going to save this just to my desktop here and we'll call this our Sterling table. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start a new project. I'm going to now load that table that we just developed into our project. And I'm just going to plop it right on screen. I'll switch to a 3D view. So you'll notice that I've got my table on screen here. I'm going to just copy that over a few feet. I'm going to select the table and I'm going to change it from my square to my rec. I'll make a copy of that real quick and I'll just pull that over just a few. And I'll change that from my rec to my bar. So you'll notice very quickly, just with a few different parameters that we've used in this project, we're able to create three different types of a table that is fully parametric. If we wanted to at some point go ahead and make an adjustment, let's say we weren't happy with the leg width, we could always edit the type of this family. And you'll notice that those parameters are right there for us to go ahead and make adjustments. That is a, a crash course on family creation. It's our introductory to family creation. Again, um, if this didn't get everything you wanted, it uh, doesn't mean we don't offer it. We definitely uh, have a lot of topics that still would be covered in our family creation class, which include things such as nesting, array parameters, detailed and complex formulas, um, as well as working with uh, parameters that are a bit more complicated um, from the, the, the typical generic ones that I worked with today. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and start uh, loading up the question board. Um, just want to go back real quick um, and show you uh, a, a quick slide here. Again, uh, we have an upcoming event February 16th with Lynn Allen, as I spoke about earlier. Um, really great opportunity to meet uh, one of the experts in all things Autodesk. Um, if, it's, if, if it's something that's taught, she knows it. Um, really, really well experienced, well, uh, well respected, and um, definitely would be a pleasure to have her uh, right here in the Scottsdale area. If you have any questions regarding the event, or would like to sign up, we will be sending out mail outs that I'm sure some of you may have already got. Uh, but please don't hesitate to contact Dave Press, um, who's the Vice President of Sales and also an Account Manager here with Sterling Systems. Um, you'll notice right there is all, all of Dave's contact information. Um, you can also reach us here in our office at 1-480-629-8131. My name is Brandon LaCourcier. I'm a senior consultant here with Sterling Systems. Right there is my extraordinarily long email address, so please feel free to write that down. Um, a couple things I want to point out. On Monday, January 16th, we're going to be having the part three of this mini lecture, which is editing family creation. So we're going to look at families similar to that table, and we're going to talk about how we can dissect them. I think we're going to talk about a door um, and see if we can't work with a piece of mechanical equipment. Um, if we have some time left over after that door family. Wednesday, January 25th, we're going to be talking about top 10 tips and tricks. We're going to be covering everything from phasing to design options and work sets, things that have always uh, been of an interest but maybe you weren't always able to cover. It's been an absolute pleasure having you guys on here this evening. Um, if you don't have any questions, you're welcome to take off. If you do uh, uh, have any questions, please go ahead and post them. Uh, again, thank you very much for taking the time to meet with us. I hope that I can uh, uh, spend some time with each of you at some point moving forward. Thank you very much.